The Ford Cortina Lotus is an amazing compact sports sedan. Produced from 1963 to 1970, this high-performance machine was born from a collaboration between Ford and Lotus cars. Let's dive into the fascinating story of this vehicle. It all began in 1961 when Colin Chapman, the founder of Lotus, set his sights on building his own engines. The Coventry Climax units Lotus had been using were expensive, and Chapman saw an opportunity to create something better. He enlisted the help of Harry Mundy, a close friend and designer of the Coventry Climax engine, to design a twin cam version of the Ford Kent engine. While the initial development focused on smaller displacement versions, everything changed in 1962 when Ford released the 116E5 bearing 1498cc engine. This became the foundation for what would become the Lotus Ford twin cam engine. Keith Duckworth from Cosworth played a crucial role in fine-tuning the engine to perfection. The engine made its debut in 1962 at the Nürburgring, powering a Lotus 23 driven by the legendary Jim Clark. But it wasn't long before the engine found its way into production cars, starting with the Lotus Elan. However, to meet motorsport regulations, the engine's capacity was quickly increased to 1,557 cc by boring out the cylinders to 82.55 mm. While the engine was in development, an exciting opportunity arose. Walter Hayes from Ford approached Colin Chapman with a proposition. Fit the new engine into 1,000 Ford saloons for Group 2 homologation. Chapman jumped at the chance, even though Lotus was busy preparing to launch the L on it. And so, the Type 28 was born, better known as the Lotus Cortina or Cortina Lotus, depending on who you asked. Ford supplied the two-door Cortina body shells and handled the marketing and sales, while Lotus took care of all the mechanical and cosmetic modifications. The Mark I Lotus Cortina was a true performance machine. At its heart was the 1,557 cc twin cam engine producing a respectable 105 horsepower. This was paired with the same close ratio gearbox used in the Lotus Elon, ensuring that every bit of power was put to good use. But the changes didn't stop there. The rear suspension received a major overhaul with the standard leaf springs replaced by coil springs and dampers. Two trailing arms and an A bracket connected to the differential housing handled axle location. To support this new setup, additional braces were added behind the rear seat and from the rear wheel arch to the chassis in the boot. Lightweight alloy panels were used for the doors, bonnet, and boot, further reducing weight and improving performance. The brakes were also upgraded with 9.5 inch front discs by Girling providing ample stopping power. Visually, the Lotus Cortina was distinct from its more pedestrian siblings. All Lotus factory cars were painted white with a green stripe, although Ford did build some for racing in red. One customer even opted for a dark blue stripe due to superstitions about the color green. Front quarter bumpers were added and round Lotus badges adorned the rear wings and the right side of the radiator grill. Inside, the changes were more subtle. A new center console accommodated the repositioned gear lever and different seats were installed. The dashboard was updated to include a tachometer, speedometer, and gauges for oil pressure, water temperature, and fuel level. A wood-rimmed steering wheel added a touch of class to the interior. The Mark I Lotus Cortina quickly gained a reputation for being a tin-top version of a Lotus 7. It was the dream car for many enthusiasts who previously had to settle for a Cortina GT or a Mini Cooper. The public was amazed by its performance, especially compared to the overweight sports cars of the time, like the Austin Healey 3000. However, the launch wasn't without its hiccups. Some Ford dealerships, unfamiliar with the specialized nature of the car, occasionally fitted incorrect parts during servicing. Early owners reported a few teething problems highlighting how quickly the car had been developed. Some engines were down on power, the gear ratios were too close, and there were issues with the differential housing separating from the casing. Ford addressed these problems through four main updates during the Mark I's production run. The first change involved swapping to a two-piece prop shaft and replacing the lightweight alloy transmission casing with the standard Ford item. The ultra-close ratio gears were also swapped for Cortina GT ratios, providing more usable gearing for everyday driving. In 1964, the entire Cortina range received a facelift. 
The Lotus version gained a full-width front grille, ventilation outlets on the rear C-pillar, and Ford's new Aeroflow ventilation system. The interior was also refreshed at this time. Perhaps the most significant change came in mid-1965 when the complex Lotus rear suspension was replaced with the leaf springs and radius arms from the Cortina GT. This eliminated the need for the additional stiffening tubes and greatly improved reliability. The final update in 1965 saw the rear drum brakes replaced with self-adjusting units and the transmission received the famous 2000E gearbox ratios. These changes struck a balance between the ultra-close ratios of the original and the more widely spaced Cortina GT ratios. As the Mark I Lotus Cortina's production wound down in late 1966, Ford was already planning its successor. The Mark II Lotus Cortina, introduced in 1967, represented a shift in philosophy. While Ford wanted to continue the model's competition success, they were concerned about the reliability issues of the Lotus-built cars. The solution was to bring production in-house. The Mark II Lotus Cortina would be built at Ford's Dagenham plant alongside other Cortina models. This meant simplifying the construction process to align with standard Cortina GT production. Visually, the Mark II was more subdued than its predecessor. Gone was the standard white with green stripe color scheme, replaced by a range of color options. Many dealers offered stripes as an optional extra. The only standard visual cues were a black front grille, 5.5J by 13 steel wheels, and Lotus badges on the rear wings and by the rear number plate. A Lotus badge on the front grille was initially offered as an option. Under the hood, the Mark II received an improved and more powerful engine, now producing 109 horsepower. This was the same engine previously offered as a special equipment option on the Lotus Elan and Cortina Lotus Mark I. The gearbox ratios remained the same as the late Mark I cars, but the Mark II GT's remote control gear change was adopted. A different final drive ratio of 3.77 to 1 was used instead of the Mark I's 3.9 to 1. The Mark II Cortina was a wider car than its predecessor, necessitating wheels with a different offset to maintain proper tracking. Radial tires became standard equipment. Other improvements included a larger fuel tank and the ability to mount the spare wheel in its well, although the battery remained in the boot for optimal weight distribution. Like its predecessor, the MK2 Lotus Cortina received a few updates during its production run. Early on, the Lotus badge on the rear panel was replaced with a new twin cam badge fitted under the Cortina script on the boot lid. A new combined clock and center console was also added. In late 1968, the entire Mark II Cortina range was updated. For the Lotus, this meant relocating the four auxiliary gauges from the top of the dash to integrate them into the main instrument panel. An internal bonnet release and a more conventional handbrake mounting were also introduced. The gear shift mechanism was updated to a new single rail design. The Cortina Lotus proved to be a formidable competitor on both the racetrack and rally stages too. In circuit racing, it was homologated for Group 2 Touring Car Competition in September 1963. Its first outing at the Olton Park Gold Cup saw it finish third and fourth, beating the previously dominant 3.8-liter Jaguars. Ford campaigned the cars in Britain, Europe, and the United States. Team Lotus ran cars in Britain for Ford. The Cortina Lotus could beat almost anything except the 7-liter V8 Ford Galaxies and later Ford Mustangs. 1964 was a banner year for the Cortina Lotus in competition. Jim Clark easily won the British Saloon Car Championship. In the U.S., Jackie Stewart and Mike Beckwith won the Marlboro 12-hour race. Allen Mann Racing performed well in the European Touring Car Challenge, including a 1-2 victory in the Motor 6-hour International Touring Car Race at Brands Hatch. The car's success continued in 1965, boosted by the increased reliability of the new leaf spring rear suspension. Sir John Whitmore dominated the European Touring Car Championship, driving for Allen Mann Racing. Jack Sears won his class in the British Saloon Car Championship, while Jackie Ix claimed the Belgian Saloon Car Championship. For 1966, Team Lotus registered new cars for the British Saloon Car Championship, which had opened up to Group 5 Special Touring Cars. With Lucas Fuel Injection and tuning by BRM, the engines could now produce 180 horsepower at 7,750 revolutions per minute, allowing them to stay competitive with the Mustangs. 
Jim Clark drove these cars to eight class wins. In rallying, the Cortina Lotus also left its mark. While it may be overshadowed by the later success of the Ford Escort, the Cortina Lotus was a force to be reckoned with in the mid-1960s. Its first outing as a proper rally car came in the 1963 RAC Rally, where Henry Taylor and co-driver Brian Melia piloted it to a respectable sixth-place finish. The car's potential was further demonstrated in the 1964 Tour de France automobile, a grueling 10-day, 4,000-mile event. Vic Elford and David Segel Morris drove their Cortina Lotus to fourth place overall in the touring car category and first in the handicap category. As reliability improved with the adoption of the GT rear suspension in 1965, the victories started to pile up. Roger Clark and Graham Robson won the Welsh International in December 1965. The following year saw successes in the Rally Sun Remo, the Acropolis Rally, and a hard-fought victory in the RSE Rally where Bengt Soderstrom and Gunnar Palm emerged victorious after a 13-minute lead. The Lotus Cortina's impact extended beyond its production years. It remains a popular choice in historic touring car racing, consistently winning its class in events around the world. The fastest officially recorded speed for a Cortina Lotus is an impressive 147 miles per hour, achieved by Mark Duquet at Mount Panorama, Bathurst in Australia. In the United States, the Cortina Lotus is well known for its competitiveness in the under 2000 CC class of the Trans Am series. In 1966, Canadian-born Australian Alan Moffat shocked the competition by winning round three of the inaugural series at Briar Motorsports Park in Loudoun, New Hampshire. The Ford Cortina Lotus represented a perfect storm of factors. Colin Chapman's engineering genius, Ford's manufacturing prowess and marketing muscle, and the competitive drive of both companies. It was a car that punched well above its weight, taking on and beating much more powerful machines on race tracks and rally stages around the world. Today, the Ford Cortina Lotus is a highly sought after classic, appreciated not just for its performance and racing pedigree, but also for its significance in automotive history. It stands as a testament to what can be achieved when two innovative companies join forces with a common goal. The Fiat 128. In 1969, Fiat introduced a car that would change the automotive world, the Fiat 128. This compact family car may not look revolutionary at first glance, but under its simple exterior lies an innovative design that shaped the cars we drive today. The Fiat 128 was a small front wheel drive car with a transverse engine layout. This means the engine was turned sideways in the front of the car with the transmission next to it. While this setup is common now, it was groundbreaking in 1969. The 128's design allowed for a spacious interior despite its compact size. Let's look at the key features that made the Fiat 128 special. The car had a 1.1 liter four-cylinder engine producing 49 horsepower. This may not sound like much today, but it was decent power for a small car in the late 1960s. The engine was designed by Aurelio Lampredi, a famous Italian engineer who also created engines for Ferrari. The 128 used an innovative drivetrain layout engineered by Dante Giacosa. The transverse engine and gearbox were placed side by side, connected to the front wheels through an offset final drive. This arrangement solved many issues with earlier front wheel drive designs. It allowed for equal length drive shafts, reducing torque steer and uneven tire wear. The suspension was also advanced for its time. The 128 had independent suspension all around, McPherson struts in front, and a transverse leaf spring in the rear. This gave it good handling and a comfortable ride. Rack and pinion steering provided responsive control. The brakes used discs in front and drums in the rear, which was a modern setup for an economy car of that era. Inside, the 128 was surprisingly roomy for its small exterior size. The transverse engine layout and front wheel drive allowed for a flat floor, and no transmission tunnel intruding into the cabin. This clever packaging meant four adults could fit comfortably despite the car's compact dimensions. The trunk was also a good size for a small car. The styling of the 128 was clean and simple. It had a boxy shape typical of the era with large windows for good visibility. While not flashy, the design was functional and aged well over the years. 
The front had rectangular headlights and a simple grille with the Fiat badge. From the side, you can see the short hood, made possible by the transverse engine layout. When it launched, the Fiat 128 was available as a two-door or four-door sedan. In 1970, a three-door station wagon called the Familiar joined the lineup. This added some versatility to the range. The wagon had a split-folding rear seat to expand the cargo area when needed. Let's talk about how the 128 drove. With its light weight of around 1,600 pounds, the small engine provided lively performance for the time. It could reach a top speed of about 85 miles per hour. More importantly, it was nimble and fun to drive around town and on twisty roads. The front wheel drive gave it good traction, especially in slippery conditions. The 128 was also economical to run. It could achieve around 30 miles per gallon, which was excellent for the era. Combined with its affordable price, this made it popular with budget-conscious buyers. The simple mechanical design also meant it was relatively easy and inexpensive to maintain. The Fiat 128's innovative engineering didn't go unnoticed. In 1970, it was named European Car of the Year. The jury praised its spacious interior, good performance, and advanced technical features. This award helped boost the 128's popularity across Europe. Over the years, the 128 received some updates to keep it fresh. In 1972, it got a minor facelift with a revised grille. 1974 saw the introduction of the 128 Special, which used a larger 1.3 liter engine in the standard body. In 1976, the car received more substantial changes, including new rectangular headlights, updated tail lights, and a refreshed dashboard. It remained in production in Italy until 1985. Over its long run, more than 3 million were built. This made it one of Fiat's most successful models. But the 128's influence extended far beyond its sales numbers. The transverse engine front-wheel drive layout pioneered by the 128 became the template for most small cars that followed. Other manufacturers studied and copied this design. For example, Volkswagen closely examined the 128 when developing the first Golf in the early 1970s. The 128's impact wasn't limited to Europe. It was also produced in several other countries. In Argentina, it was built from 1971 to 1990 as both a sedan and a unique five-door wagon. In Yugoslavia, it formed the basis for the Zastava 128 sedan and Zastava 101 hatchback, which remained in production until 2008. Versions were also made in countries like Spain, Poland, and Egypt. Despite its importance, the Fiat 128 isn't as well remembered as some of its contemporaries. This may be because it was a practical everyday car rather than an exotic sports model. However, automotive journalists and historians recognize its significance. In 2012, Jamie Kitman of Automobile Magazine called the 128 a pioneer of the small cars we drive today. The 128 wasn't perfect, of course. Like many Fiats of its era, it had issues with rust in some markets. The early models also had some reliability concerns, though these improved over the years. And while its performance was good for its time, by modern standards, it would feel quite slow. One interesting fact about the 128 is that Fiat claimed in its advertising that Enzo Ferrari drove one as his personal vehicle. While Ferrari was closely associated with Fiat, it's hard to verify if this claim was true or just clever marketing. The 128's engineering also found its way into a sports car. The Fiat X1-9, introduced in 1972, used the 128's engine and transmission in a mid-engine layout. This shows how versatile and well-regarded the 128's mechanicals were. In some markets, it was used as the basis for more luxurious or sporty models by other companies. For example, the Italian company Moretti produced limited numbers of 128 model-based coupes and convertibles with custom bodywork. And towards the end of its production run in Italy, the 128 was mainly sold in its base 1.1 liter form, as newer Fiat models took over the higher end of the compact car market. However, in some other countries like Argentina, it continued to be developed and updated into the 1980s. Today, the Fiat 128 is becoming appreciated as a classic car. Its simple, robust mechanicals make it relatively easy to maintain compared to more complex vintage cars. 
Its historical importance also adds to its appeal for collectors. However, due to rust issues and the fact that it was seen as a basic economy car for many years, surviving examples in good condition are becoming rare in some markets.